What is the meaning of it? Dear participants at the International Philosophy and Film Conference, the first International Philosophy and Film Conference, welcome to our third session for today, third and final session. Uh, let me express one more time our gratitude for your willingness to be with us today and to share your thoughts and ideas uh, on those exciting topics of common interest. Um, our conference as our joint intellectual endeavor is the greatest proof of the autonomy and power of the space of thought, which is unaffected by the limitations of the physical space, obviously, because it has always been and, it always, and will always be the space of freedom and togetherness. As you already know uh, by uh, our consulting our program, uh, on this session, we have five lectures and one general discussion uh, in the end, in which uh, we can address many questions that uh, were left uh, unanswered or uh, undiscussed during the previous session. And also the uh, lecture, the questions concerning the presentation and lectures in this session. I would also uh, like to greet our uh, live, I, our online audience, and to remind uh, all the participants in the conference that are following uh, us by uh, live streaming that they can um, um, join the discussion by uh, writing their questions in the Q and A section. Our team will, co will collect them, and we uh, will try to answer uh, as much of them as possible. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, ado, I would like to announce our first uh, speaker, uh, our keynote speaker in this uh, session. Uh, we are very honored to have Professor uh, Dominique Chateau uh, as our keynote speaker uh, in this session in the conference. Uh, let me introduce uh, just uh, briefly uh, Professor Dominique Chateau. He is a professor emeritus at the prestigious University of Paris and Panthéon Sorbonne and member of the ACT Institute research team. Uh, his, uh, he has earned his degrees in philosophy and logic at the Sorbonne. Uh, he taught uh, aesthetics, philosophy of art and film studies. He is uh, also currently a lecturer uh, at the École Supérieure du Paysage in Versailles and uh, editorial director of the Nouvelle Revue d'Esthétique. Uh, he is uh, author of many books, uh, including the following, Plastic Arts, Archaeology of a Notion, uh, Cinema and Philosophy, a Subjectivity in the Cinema, The Aesthetization of Art, Contemporary Art and Cinema, After Charlie, The Denial of Representation, A Japanese Aesthetics, Art and Taste in Floating Mode, and also uh, um, the author of uh, still unpublished book, which is soon to be published uh, by Classique Garnier, uh, untitled uh, L'idée cinématographique, the cinematographic idea. 
Uh, so the title of his uh, presentation is uh, a good, uh, I mean, um, another proof of the interconnectedness of uh, our different uh, cultural tradition paths and um, of the, the, these crossroads of questions of common interest. He will talk uh, about Mil Chomanchevsky's film Before the Rain. Uh, the title of his uh, lecture, keynote lecture, is The Film is Not Round, Mil Chomanchevsky's Before the Rain, 1994. So please, uh, Professor Chateau, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, Film Philosophy International Conference. I'm very happy and much honored. Uh, great thanks to the PFF team, a special thanks to Anna, but now there is two Anna to thank. No, <laughs> it's, a, it's a double thank to the two Anna. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to lecture on Neil Shomanchevsky's Before the Rain because I like very much this movie, um, perhaps because I particularly like films whose very structure is enigmatic. So uh, the, film, the film is, uh, is not round. Uh, uh, I gave this title. Uh, I tried to, uh, to share my screen. Yes, yes, it is. Well, so I, um, I gave this title to my text for two reasons. Firstly, um, because before the rain is known to be complicated. Um, and for instance, uh, the French journal Les Inrock speaks of a convoluted narrative structure. And uh, Jan Christie uh, writes of the film uh, as a never ending story. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that my title has to do with the fact that the film repeats a strange sentence several times. The circle is not round. So the, the circle is not round is a kind of motto. Uh, it can be at least used to explain the comments of critics who found the film complicated. For my sake, I even guess it's a key to the explanation of the film, but a special key. Uh, I don't know if the, the director conceived the film as a lock for this key, uh, but my method, if I may use this challenging term, is to do so, to insert this key in the lock and this way of working and thinking is, in my eyes, what the perspective of philosophy of film allows. Um, but I say, yes, a key, but a very special key. Actually, this key is unsuitable to the film insofar as it would close it with a final interpretation. It rather opens interpretation. It opens discussion and probably a never ending discussion. Film philosophy, as I mean it, isn't an applied philosophy. Uh, uh, take a philosophy or a philosopher, apply it to, to a film. No, no, film philosophy, as I mean it, is uh, the attempt to give an account of the spirit of the film with the help of philosophers, of other thinkers, scientists, critics, artists, and most of the time with thoughts that come directly to the mind, and unfortunately to my mind. Um, following Erwin Panofsky, we could call this method iconology. Uh, that is a way of considering a film, I quote uh, Panofsky, which one could name a philosophy if it would have formed a rational system. So if it would have formed a rational system. Yes, although a film isn't a system, at least not in the same sense as a philosophical discourse. Moreover, Regarding before the, the rain, before the rain, the search for a rational system is likely to be disappointing. Uh, in any case, if we associate to rationality the ideas of order, logic, and normality. If before the rain has to do with logic, it's in a broad sense. More exactly, in the sense of this special type of logic, which is called paraconsistent logic. Uh, that, that is, a logic opened to contradictions. So this special type of, 
of logic uh, will be my special key. To begin, we have to face the contradiction between circle and round. Uh, this idea of uh, the circle that is not round makes me think irresistibly to the Zen circle, the Enzo, uh, a symbol of both emptiness and completion uh, that appears frequently in Japanese painting and calligraphy. Made by hand in a single jet, uh, in this case, a uh, circle painted with a single brush stroke of Aquin et Kaku, um, it has both the perfection of the circle and the imperfection of the instantaneous and motion. The Zen circle is never quite round. It is a broken um, or blurred or associated with some sign of imperfection. You see in this case, uh, of uh, this, uh, this painting of Taquan, so uh, an, old, uh, an old rusty nail associated with the circle. So it's a, uh, the, the, the rusty nail is imperfection, uh, decay of time, and so on. Of course, I don't claim that Before the Rain is a Zen film. I don't know if it, if it is a Zen film, simply inspired by the philosophy of the Zen circle and my modest Japanese culture. I tried to communicate with the content of the film through the analysis of the way it's organized around its leitmotiv. So if, if I can say, uh, if I could say that, uh, uh, my main thought about film philosophy is that philosophy doesn't only make explicit what in the film is implicit, but faces a challenge to give an account of the very fact that what philosophy can make explicit remains implicit in the film. About Before the Rain, two questions come to my mind. The first one concerns its filmic structure as such, given the general tendency to qualify it negatively. The second one concerns the spectator activity, given the various assumptions that the complex structures of the film implies. Unlike criticism that focus only on the film content, I think that structure isn't the business of analysts or theorists who benefit from converting the films into academic papers and lectures. Structure is strongly implied in the spectatorial activity, even if it remains unconscious. And it weighs no less strongly on the aesthetic judgment. And Before the Rain perfectly illustrates this point. Let us see its structure. The film belongs to the category uh, of the works of art, which gives the impression of a disorder uh, comparable to that produced by sh shuffling the cards. The film is divided into three parts, words, figures, images. Their narrative succession looks clear, at least if we disregard the order of appearance in the film, an unexpected order or disorder. The, the first part comes second, the second comes third, and the third comes at first. No one could do better. Putting these parts in the right order, we get, at least apparently, the simple story of a war photographer, Alexander, who living Anne, the woman he loves in, in London, returns to Macedonia to meet his childhood sweetheart, Anna, who asks him to protect her daughter, Zamira. And then Zamira runs away, takes refuge in the cell of a monastery where Kirill, a young monk and the photographer's nephew, falls in love with her. He protects her until she is killed. All this happens in the context of ethnic religious rivalries between Macedonians and Albanians, whose communities respectively perpetrate the murders. Like many fictional feature films, Milcho Manchevsky's one is not limited to its plot. Not only it is enriched by underlying themes, silence, face, images, and so on, brought to the visual surface by various motifs involved in the narrative, but what defines it above all is a manifest will to disturb 
the normal order of a story, the expected causality, the ineluctable progression which goes from the beginning to the end. However, this vocabulary falls into the, the defect I, I want to avoid, that of considering negatively the structure of the film, just like with the word convoluted, concerning a story or a sentence that means uh, overly complex and uneasy to, to follow. And uh, the same with endless stories, uh, endless stories idea that denotes a break with the time standard. It is true that Manchesky emphasizes negativity by repeating his paradox of the circle that is not round, the circle that is not round. More precisely, just before we see an imperfect circle built by children with twigs to serve as an arena for a total fight, a monk, Brother Marco, firstly pronounces the aphorism increased by a consideration of time. Uh, not only the circle is not round, but time never dies. It reappears in the second episode as a graffiti on a brick wall near Alexander who is calling a cab. It is pronounced again by the monk who says to, Kir to Kirill during the final reprise of the initial scene, come, it is time, and time does not wait, and the circle is not round. We can, we, we can hypothesize that the cinematographic idea underlying the overall shape of Before the Rain has to do with this enigma without even quibbling about the difference between circle and round. You should probably think about the difference between line and volume, figure and form, and so on. In, in any case, we will look for what in this film, by prolonging time, prevents, prevents the circle from closing, prevents the circle from closing. But before that, we must return to the circle. Follow, sorry. Just, Following this disruption of the order of the parts that would otherwise have constituted a clear scenario, uh, an, overla an overlap occurs that is likely to found the idea of a temporal circle. The end of the third part, where we see Kirill picking tomatoes before returning to the monastery, repeats with some variations the beginning of the first. Overall, the film can give the impression of a story that goes round in circles in the manner of the so-called Ouroboros form, the, the, the snake that bites its own tail uh, and possibly associated with the Zen circle, as you can see, um, a, form of an, a form often invoked by writers and filmmakers of the Nouveau Roman, such as Alain Rob Grillet, Who's Lom Kimon, The Man Who Lies, 1968, is, is a brilliant example of this. After many restarts, its narrator resets his story at the end. As in this film, between the initial story of Before the Rain and its resumption, there is a variation of representation prefigured in the variance that affects the basic aphorism, the circle is not round. The accident of the third occurrence illustrates particularly the idea of the imperfect circle in its fundamental contradiction. While supposedly the circle contradicts the arrow of time that is stretched forward. Well, I, I'm far from insensitive to the ideological, ideological and political aspects of this film, especially since at the same time, uh, I discovered before the rain, I, I, and I confess the cinema of North, North Macedonia, including as a shining example, God Exists, her name is Petrunia, uh, directed by, by Teona Strugar Mitzevska. So at the same time, I was considering 1947 Earth, one of the films in Deepa Mehta's beautiful trilogy, which also shows the unfortunate consequences that wars between religious communities have on human relations. Both films are supposed to be pleas for the overcoming of communal rivalries. In, in, in Manchesky film, Kirill is Macedonian, Zamira is Albanian, Alexander is Macedonian, Anna is Al Albanian, 
and it is as if this transgression, trans, sorry, if, if this transgression of social religious barriers was passed from uncle to nephew, from Alexander to Kirill. Beyond this notable aspect of the film, my attention was mainly drawn to the apparent defects of the film as we talk about the apparent movements of, of planets, that is to say what seems to be the real movement, but is not. Apart from spotting jump cuts and goofs, film analysis is not a bug fixing, and everything leads us to believe that the defects of the film are voluntary. The process of analysis, establishing a back, back and forth between distant passages of the film leads to hypothesis. And this intellectualized spectatorial activity of the film professor uh, is comparable to uh, abduction, which is, according to the semiotician and philosopher Charles Peirce, a mode of reasoning that one mobilizes when one has, I quote, the feeling that a theory, that a theory is necessary to explain the surprising facts. The feeling that a theory is necessary to explain the surprising facts. Uh, by the way, in contradiction with the uh, anti-intellectualist opinion shared by some, some film critics, the analysis uh, does not kill the aesthetic feeling. On the contrary, it offers new nourishment of this kind of test. On the other hand, I am fully aware of the fact that analysis quickly and definitively distances, on, distances us from the initial uh, spectatorial state, which admittedly is as, as, as abstract as the Roland Barthes zero, de, zero degree of writing, uh, given the inter individual disparities, but reunites, reunites our consciousness in the consented abandonment to the filmic flow. And uh, in, the film, in the filmic flow uh, resides the best of the Sinephile pleasure. Approaching, because, approaching the film, uh, Manchesky film, Before the Rain, in this state of mind, um, my first experience was rather easy. I had the vague feeling of narrative overlaps and apparent inconsistencies in terms of aesthetic feeling, a certain uneasiness, quite conductive to triggering the desire to know more. Yes, it made me feel a little uneasy, but the kind that, instead of making me move on, made me want to know more. I then entered in what Paul Valéry names the aesthetic infinity, a characteristic of the reception of artworks. Instead of extinguishing the desire, as eating when one is hungry, it is um, it uh, it calls for its prolongation. It calls for its prolongation. So I immediately started to inform myself about the film, and especially started to anal analyze it by rewatching passages several times, in the hope of making the process of abduction succeed. This Persian concept, which means role integrate. Intrigued by a strange form, I invent hypothesis to understand it. And my pleasure has not diminished. On the contrary, um, especially since in any process of uh, deciphering an enigma, it is the enigma itself that provokes the greatest pleasure by this sort of uh, disturbance of enjoyment, that is, to the aesthetic verdict, what for plays to orgasm. I have therefore first taken into consideration what varies in the apparently duplicated representation of the beginning of the first part and the end of the third part, and thus gain the foothold in the paradox of the imperfection of the circle. The main variation Voilà. The main variation between the first scene and the reprise is that first we only meet Zamira when Kirill discovers her hiding in the room, uh, in her room, while in the reprise we see her, the, we see Zamira running towards 
the monastery where we can assume she will hide. So the closing of the circle in order for it to really go round is made by this discrepancy between the two versions that sanctions the possibility of representing the same event from two different points of view. I think of the emblematic two versions of the dual in the Man Who Shot Liberty Valence from 1962. The same scene is shown from two points of view. And the second one revealing uh, uh, reveals who really is the man who killed Liberty Valence. In fact, the theme of time that does not die is contradicted both by Alexander's time and the movie's time. For Alexander, time stops with his death. For the film, time stops exactly where the film stops. Because of this closed, finite, and ineluctable character of filmic time, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre said that the film is the opposite of contingency. Mm. Manchewski doesn't abolish this, uh, this true feature of the medium. Uh, insofar as no one escapes it, even by the longest film in the world. But he circumvents it by drawing series of cir circles and intersections in order to avoid sinking into the boredom of perfect circularity. Already attenuated by the imperfection of the repetition of the same scene at the beginning and at the end of the film, the Apparently, dominant cinematographic idea of a restart that sounds like a narrative uh, trans translation of fatality is countered in favor of a disnarrative work. This concept of disnarrative has been coined by Rob Grier, not with the Greek prefix DIS, which denotes division, but with the Greek prefix DYS, which denotes difficulty, crisis. Uh, think of dyslexia, for example. It means that regular storytelling in many of, his, uh, of its aspects is put in an unstable state, in crisis. It can be interpreted in the light of the, the not round circle. Um, the, zen, the, the Zen circle uh, is in such a state, the circle is not round, means something like a discircular circle, as well as the Enzo may be open, fully drawn, blurred, or counterbalanced by the old nail. Uh, and uh, the narrative forms may be open, rough, blurred, convoluted, or contradictory. I will consider now a series of uh, critical passages located in each of the three parts of Before the Rain, because they contain an unexpected disnarrative form in both the common and the technical sense. The common sense obviously refers to the perplexity of the spectator in front of the unexpected anomalies. The technical sense refers to the exercise of the specialist, but even the amateur of so-called convoluted narrations, as I'm afraid to be, the simple first vision does not allow to find the serenity of a perfect comprehension. The film leaves us in a kind of fog uh, as long as we reason with the old patterns of the classic narrative form, based on the worldview we have internalized from our daily experience of the world. But for most of us, even though the real world is the only possible world, we know and we like that works of fiction in cinemas and literature propose us other possible worlds. So in the real world, you die and then you are buried. A weird disnarrative sequence of um, before the rain proposes the opposite. After Kirill's meeting with Zamira, we attend a funeral with Macedonian villagers, some of them heavily armed. We get a fleeting glimpse of the body of the dying man and his face, long hair, mustache, and beard. It's not clear how the viewer could identify this man. It is by rewatching the film that we can identify surely him. This is, it is, this is Alexander already died, unless he will be killed only at the movie end. The sequence 
given the, narr the disnarrative reversal of the course of events, can be understood retroactively as a foresight of what will follow. It is more than a premonition given the weight of realities that the representation of the funeral conveys. Immediately afterwards, armored villagers stormed the search of St. John at Caneo and then the monastery in search of Samira, this uh, Albanian young woman who is wrongly accused of having killed a Macedonian. Sometimes something strange happens again during the funeral. Suddenly, the camera pans to a young woman alone in the landscape who says, oh my God, clearly she is witnessing the scene like the viewer. Is she the mediator of our gaze? This young woman is Anne, Alexander's girlfriend from London. But let's remember, we will only discover their relationship in the second part of the film. Moreover, there is no evidence that she made the trip from London to the Macedonian village. The opposite seems even more plausible. In the second part of Before the Rain, there is another disturbing detail whose obvious effect is to break the, lin the linearity of the narrative as well as to counteract the sense of circularity. Alexander, before leaving Anne to return to his village in Macedonia, gives her some photographs he's supposed to have taken that show Zamira dead, Kirill, uh, by her side with the police and a filming photographer who could be Alexander but does not look uh, that much like him. In this scene that is obviously reminiscent of Antonioni's blow up, Anne looks at the photograph with a magnifying glass on a light table. After the examination of the photo, Anne receives a phone call from someone who, speaking in French, asks for Alexander. Just after we see the photographer on his way out, in front of his brick wall where he's written, time never dies. The circle is not round. Who phones Anne? Kirill? But he has taken a vow of silence. Why, don't, why does he speak now? And why does he speak in French? Because the actor who plays him, Grégoire Collin, is French? Unable to decide what it is, what means this moment of transgression of the narrative fact, one obviously evokes Jean-Luc Godard. In this particularly troubling moment, we don't know at which stage of the story we are, and the enigma will not be cleared, later, cleared up later. It might seem that the last part escapes the disnarrative work, but if work can be understood here, as in the Freudian expression of dream work, it is quite the opposite. Alexander, Alexander has returned to his native land. Asleep in, in, in his bed, he is awakened by the village, village teacher, who, um, after he has rejected her advances, asks him, still dreaming about Anna? He finds, then he finds Anna with her family. She welcomes him freshly. But while, so that was uh, the, the preceding scene. So he, he but while he leaves, uh, Anna addresses him a sustained glance. Anna, Anne, and this, this Anna, 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 another Anna, Anna, Anne, this duality is a crucial element of the film. Uh, because the second part focuses on Anne, and the third one on uh, Anna. Anne tries in vain to reach Alexander by phone in Macedonia. The operator of the village post office does not speak English. This failure could have decided her to meet Alexander in Macedonia, as the shots of the first part might su su suggest, and she would have arrived too late to attend the funeral. But this hypothesis is no more substantiated than the rest. The film has resolutely shifted from Anne to Anna, in parallel with the fate of Alexander. But it could be just um, as well that we are in a kind of twilight zone between reality and dream, a back and, a back and forth between the two, the two zones. After various scenes concerning, among other things, the murder of which 
Zamira is wrongly accused. Alexander, once again asleep in his bed, sees Anna in a dream in the back of the room. He suddenly wakes up and says, Anna, but there is no one there. He goes to fall asleep again, and this time is awakened by a presence. First, the movement of a shadowy figure. Then Anna herself asking him to help her by protecting Zamira, as if she were yours, she tells him. Alexander has taken Anna's hand, this tactile contact intended to give physicality to the, say, to the scene, but nothing forbids, given the first scene where Anna appears fittingly, to see it again as a dream or a hallucination. I coined the, the concept of the films that dream uh, about David Lynch's Twin Peaks. Uh, the text on, on this concept appears in the book Story, published by Amsterdam University Press. So I coined this concept in order to consider more carefully the fact that what Freud named the work of dream, beyond the, cont the content of a dream, could apply to some kind of film structures. In the films that dreams, genre, or kind of, the work of the dream characterizes not only what happens in the story, the dreams of the characters, but the narrative and formal structure of the film. In this kind of film, the normal order of the story can be disrupted. In Before the Rain, the narrative cards have been shuffled or rather reorder, reordered skillfully. Alexander is su supposed to have filmed, to have um, uh, filmed in Macedonia the final scene of the first episode, while in the second part he's supposed to return to his country, while in the third he dies before Zamira to allow his escape to the most, uh, monastery and so on. In this kind of film, structures at distance, what I call telestructures, are of particular importance. In any film where there are many references at a distance that serve to give consistency to the narrative, in addition to the relations of closer and order. In Before the Rain, there is more, a network of formal telestructures creating another film that is not only superimposed on the first film, oh. above all, crosses it and innervates it with a neural network. Neural networks have the property of plasticity and telestructures give plasticity to the film. Now, and to finish at last, why Before the Rain? This is another leitmotif of the film in addition to being its title. From the brother Marco who evokes its arrival at the beginning and at the end to Alexander's final line after his murder, it is omnipresent in occurrential link with the aphorism of the circle that is not round. So we can still make different assumptions. The rain may be related to the circle, to the cycle, the cycle of mother nature, or it may be a reference to the line of time that advances ineluctably. This time will, but this time will also come at some point, but it is also a moment of rupture and so on. Again, the circle is not round. Some people have only one idea to take shelter. This is the advice that brother Marco gives to Kirill. Others, we were looking forward to it, see it as a blessing from nature. Rain either soaks us or saves us. And uh, at the end of the film, the, the rain uh, washes away the blood from Alexander's wounds, while Zamira seems to enjoy for a moment the same rain that washes over her face. Kirill is already in the shelter, but this freshness is waiting for him. So here is again this underlying network, which I did not explore all the extent, which gives to Manchesky's work all its density, that of a film which does not turn around because it is detracted from itself. Uh, I have not uh, analyzed everything. Uh, I have not solved all the enigmas of the film. And this is why, after having enjoyed seeing Manchester's film and seeing it again and again after analysis, I continue to look at it with that kind of fascination with, as for some theorists of the 18th century, in particular, Archibald Allison, whose essays on the nature and principles of taste, 1890, 
are are little known but great. So uh, it's uh, it's for me the the this uh, this for me the that. Uh, this kind of fascination for me represents the art of aesthetic attitude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chateau. Uh, and uh, really, I, I think that uh, this wonderful and inspiring lecture would uh, give uh, many um, topic and very interesting perspective for discussion. But unfortunately, uh, we can't allow this luxury now uh, because uh, of a very uh, rich again, agenda of the conference, uh, we must proceed with our form uh, further, our next uh, lecture. Uh, so please, uh, all the participants, please just note your uh, thoughts and um, questions regarding uh, all these lectures that would be presented in the session. And then I hope that we will have enough time to uh, address at least uh, some of them. So uh, thank you again. Uh, now uh, it is my pleasure to announce our next speakers, Professor Georgios Arabatsis and uh, Professor Evangelos uh, Protopapadakis. Uh, they uh, come from Greece, uh, from the Department of Philosophy uh, of uh, National and Capodistrian University of Athens, Greece. Uh, professor Arabatis, besides being associate professor uh, of the Department of Philosophy, uh, is also director of the Institutional Discourse Research Lab at the same university. And uh, Professor Protopapadakis is head of the Greek unit of UNESCO chair in bioethics and also director of the uh, Applied Philosophy Research Lab of the uh, National and Papadistian University of Athens, Greece. The title of their presentation, of their lecture, is a look. Uh, Besson's The Fifth Element and the Notion of Quintessence. Please proceed. The floor, rather the screen, <laughs> is yours. Thank you, Anna, if I may. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Professor Sato, please allow me to extend uh, Professor Arabadzi's uh, 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 greetings. He, he used to be a stu student of yours uh, uh, back at the time in, uh, in Sorbonne. Okay, uh, unfortunately, uh, George Arabadzis is not able to be with us uh, at the moment because he has uh, exams. Uh, I'm having mine afterwards. So uh, if the, the time is, uh, is okay, uh, I'll try to, to, to give a short uh, account of also of George Arabadzis part of the, of, the, of the presentation. If the time they, that doesn't suffice. Uh, I will just uh, leave you with mine, and uh, you you may see the rest of it in the proceedings when they hopefully uh, are, are out. So let me say our um, uh, our presentation concerns the fifth element uh, by Luc Besson. The fifth element is a science fiction cult classic. Sorry. <laughs> Um, minor accident. Uh, these things happen when we're doing <laughs> that kind of presentations. Sorry. The Fifth Element is a science fiction cult classic directed and co-written by Luc, uh, Luc, Luc Besson and starring among others Bruce Willis, Mila Jovovich, Gary Oldman and Prince. The title and the plot of the film refer to a central notion in Greek philosophy, to, to a, a notion that is central to, uh, to Greek philosophy, that is Pemptusia or quintessence. Pre-Socratic natural philosophers such as Thales, Anaxagoras, Anaximenes, and others were convinced that all natural beings, in fact, in fact, nature itself, consist in four primary imperishable elements or essences in Greek, usie, that is fire, earth, water, and air. To this, Aristotle added a fifth element, ether, pemptusia. A fifth element, pemptusia, pemptusia. The introduction of ether is a fifth element, as a fifth element gave birth to a great tradition in late antiquity and medieval philosophy, and eventually came to signify not an additional primary element, but the core essence of all beings, their fundamental ontological structure. 
It is exactly this philosophical tradition that Besson draws upon, but his understanding of the concept is typical of contemporaneity and the way it tends to explain the riddle of existence. Thus, the fifth element in the film is portrayed as existentially personified and also even as gendered, adjusting thus the traditional philosophical import of the term in accordance to modernity into an imminent and temporal context where in addition aesthetics play a crucial role. The plot is more or less typical of science fiction movies. In a somewhat dystopic future, the universe, Earth in particular, is threatened by evil. The only hope for mankind is an extraterrestrial being, the fifth element, who comes to Earth every 5,000 years to protect the humans with four stones of the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air. However, the spacecraft that is bringing the fifth element back to Earth is destroyed by the forces of evil, and only the remains of the fifth element eventually reach Earth. A team of scientists use the DNA of the remains to be rebuilt it in the form of a perfect being called Lilu in the movie. Lilu escapes from the laboratory and stumbles upon the taxi driver and former elite commando, Major Corbin Dallas, which is Bruce Willis, who helps her to escape. Lilu asks him for his help in order to accomplish her mission. The Evo uses its paws and influential representative on Earth together with a team of mercenaries to retrieve the stones and annihilate Lilu. Corbin Dallas, who has fallen in love with Lilu, offers his invaluable protection and helps her retrieve the stones. When Dallas and Lilu finally reach the designated place, a temple, and place the four stone, the four elements in their proper positions on the altar, they discover that there is still something missing to activate the weapon that would destroy evil. The fifth element appears to be something else and not Lilu. It was not until Galileo who changed the acceptable way of talking about matter and its motion by introducing one and only corporeal element that is matter, that the Aristotelian universe lost its, its standing. Up to Galileo, Aristotelian, Neoplatonic and scholastic cosmology distinguished neatly between super and sub, sublunary regions. The super lunar, lunar region and the celestial bodies within it were composed entirely of either. This fifth element or quintessence was devoid of all chains other than that of perfect unending circular motion. The sublunary region comprised the remaining four elements, fire, air, water, and earth, which by nature observed finite linear motion up, upwards and downwards. In addition to finite local motion, <coughs> excuse me, bodies composed of the sublunary elements continuously underwent, underwent generation and cor corruption. In this respect, the superlunary region was superior to the sublunary one. Indeed, even with the sublunary region, according to many authors, the four elements were organized hierarchically, hierarchically with, with Earth as the dullest and grossest element at the center of cosmos, and fire as the nimblest and subtlest sublunary element akin to the neighboring celestial region. The fifth element, Ida, is still present in Bacon's cosmology in the form of active or pneumatic matter that is relevant to, to its celestial, to the celestial realm, in contrast to passive or transible matter that is akin to the terrest terrestrial realm. Even Immanuel, Ka Immanuel, Immanuel Kant finds the inclusion of either a rather convenient in his doctoral thesis, which was, was under the title On Fire. To Kant, either can be established a priori as the, an all-encompassing element, an elastic medium that permeates the molecular interstices of bodies and makes possible the emission of heat and light. Leaving all particular explanations aside, some of them are tend to be evidently queer. 
The introduction of either by cosmologists and physicists serves the purpose of explaining phenomena that at times seemed impossible to be dealt with, be it the emission of light and heat or the existence of a seemingly unchangeable celestial, celestial cosmos that surrounds terrestrial beings that are subject to constant change and obey the irresistible forces of matter. In a world, the notion of either has been introduced as the only possible solution to an impossible problem, not at all unlike the assumption of the Higgs boson, the particle of God, by modern physicists. Science advances based upon what is tangible and sensible, but also by assuming what escapes observation and proof, but has to be existing if the system, any given system, is to be explained and proved. In that sense, either indeed permeates and consists all as the ultimate solution to the riddle of existence, and the way Besson portrays it is absolutely accurate, save for that either in, the, in the, this case is unconditional, desperate love that eventually saves the day. In a, sen in a sense, Besson's, Besson claims that what makes the world possible, and this is the heyday of his story, is love. And this is his answer to the riddle of existence. That was my, my part. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Uh, I don't know if Professor Arabadis is with us, and I don't know how much time is, is left for that, this one, this presentation. Uh, Anna, could you please? We have around 10 minutes for your slot. So if you think that you can make in about 10 minutes uh, the rest of the presentation, 10, 12 minutes, please uh, proceed. That's right. So. And Professor Arbadis is not in the room from what I'm seeing in the background. Yeah, he's, he's not in the, in the room. Um, I'll he's try to, to give a brief, a brief account. Uh, actually, this is not, not, not my part, and I, I probably won't do justice to Professor Arbadis' uh, part, but I'll try to read, uh, read uh, a selection of what he has uh, written and sent, me, sent to me for, for a case of emergency <laughs> like, like this one. So let me just uh, uh, read a few few words from uh, a few paragraphs from Professor Arbadzi's uh, uh, part, and uh, I, I, I wish he's here, he's with us during the discussion, and have the chance to say more. The cinema, the cinema goer enters the world of spectacle through channels that are rather familiar to him, and are often often none other than his well-known cinematic gems. I, I, I'm reading Professor Arbadzi's part. The various legible genres, uh, that is, ad adventures, westerns, romance, comedy, detective fiction, etc., et involve the sense of intimacy that is necessary to tune in to the rhythm of cinematic visioning that some film critics see it close to the pro process of hypnosis. The titles of the film intro, together with a musical theme, in addition to the information they provide, serve to calm the, the soul and the body of the viewer and to facilitate the basic psychological functions of watching a film, such as identification. Thus, a film in a hypnotic environment approaches very much the dream world, even in the waking state, as well as the desired images that are not missing from the common life, but are inserted in even the most ordinary activities. Among, among the most popular cinematic genres is that of science fiction, although it, in recent years it tends to be sidelined side by the genre we call fantasy. As a genre, science fiction has a special interest as it is associated with the world, with the world cosmos, in the two meanings that the term has, the, has had since ancient times. The world, first of all, refers to the physical species and bodies that make it up, to the forces and energies that, that are expressed and exercised within it. In the second sense, the world cosmos, as it was understood later in antiquity, is the crowd, the municipality, the people. These two concepts are still valid today in everyday language. As for the cinematic science fiction, it really connects the cosmological interest with the collectivity, yields to the applause of the society. See, for example, the great success of the Star Wars series. 
There is, however, another idea by which science fiction is associated with the world. It is the critical and sometimes satirical mood with which it treats the, society, the, the social world around it. The future, the interplanetary action depicted in films is often nothing more than a, a commentary on current social fiction. From this point of view, science fiction is particularly suited to the cinematic medium which, as we know it, is characterized by its realism. Although in cinema, realism means the imitation of movement in terms of Renaissance perspective, which in Western culture has taken the obvious feature of naturalism. In addition, the realistic nature of cinema, which one may perceive as ideology, allows for a much more dramatic performance of effects, for example, related to the stellar space. Thus, a script for a space that, say, begins its journey in space when captured on the screen acquires real operatic dimensions. The fifth element relates to science fictions in a semi-parody, semi-loyal manner, and this genealogy of the metaphysical is a highly technical cult in a highly, highly technical culture covers the metaphysical function function of its technology. It is important to understand more widely that the most powerful rise of techno science, such as the one depicted in the film, goes beyond European modernism and is, is a part of a long history, that of the in institutionalization of the technological spirit. This institution, on the other hand, is a purely metaphysical movement. Modern science, and uh, Anna, please, uh, when the time is near, just tell me. Okay. Modern science, as is well known, does not allow for itself any ultimate purposes, such as, for example, universal happiness, but captures and engages in processes of producing scientific objects objects under conditions of refutability rather than verifiability. Technoscience, on the other hand, sets clear historical aspirations such as man's domination of nature, either as intellectual superiority that brings man closer to God, or as a simple domination of the human species over other natural species on the big stage of the world. Technoscience thus replicates the world in order to construct a world compatible with the desires of a subject of dominant, dominant action, conventionally called the human subject, such as the film spectator. In this way, technoscience begins by constructing a world image, or in other words, by constructing a system of general representations, and therefore is in fact a metaphysics. Human culture is distinguished by the transformation of natural species into cultural beings. The techno science, however, in techno science, however, this transformation is colored by destructive tendencies that lead to a kind of solipsism of the human species, and in the film, it may, may be parallel to voyeurism. Five Nowhere, minutes. Okay. Please. Yeah. Around five minutes, if you if you can wrap. Uh, we, still have, we still have my five minutes. Yes, five minutes. Uh, I think they will suffice. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, nowhere else in this solipsism as obvious as in the modern development of the iconosphere or the dominance of the media. As time goes on, it becomes more and more obvious that one of the goals of critical philosophy should be the study, analysis, a normative determination of the new political universe. In this way, a new development in the critical effort has appeared, going from the linguistic turn of the 20th century to the iconological term of the 21st century. The fifth element is thus contributing to the above metaphysicism of the image and the parodic identification of the met of metaphysical coincidence with, lo with love is situated on a field beyond criticism in a space that is both cinematic, typical, and semi-romantic. It is true that the film, in its newly hedonistic romanticism, with its adventure and special effects commercially panoply, 
does not allow for any measure of this in this transiation. Yet for us, the identification of the conditioned imaginary of the film is never total. There is a part that remains irreducible to cinematic control that would take the form of the techno science of film viewing. There is still the nostalgia of the childlike universe of wonder and the desire proper to the body of the young woman protagonist. The cinematic complementarity of these two elements, the splitting and duality of the fifth element in its paradoxical nature produces the part that remains beyond framing. I, I, I cut off some here and there. I wish I didn't do injustice to, to George's part. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for, for listening. Quite on the contrary, I, we are very grateful for, for, to you for sharing also the thoughts of your uh, colleague. We are uh, we hope that uh, in some future occasion we will be able also to uh, meet him in person. And thank you very much for this uh, illuminative reflection on Digi Besson's The Fifth Element. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, we will postpone the questions related uh, to your presentation for the general discussion. And now it's my pleasure to announce our next speaker, Professor Senka Anastasova. Uh, she is uh, an associate professor of Faculty of Dramatic Art in Skopje, but also an international renowned scholar, uh, because she is also a Beatrice Bain visiting uh, fellow univer in the University of California, Berkeley, US, also member of the International Board of Hypatia Journal of Feminist Philosophy, and her fields of interest are uh, political philosophy aesthetic and especially cultural uh, studies. So the title of her uh, presentation is Femme Philosophy and Social Reproduction Theory in slash after the times of crisis. Uh, Professor Anastasova, please uh, proceed. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm really delighted to be a, a part of this panel of discussions that uh, could open some another aspects of social reproductional theory related to cinematic thinking, philosophy, women, uh, studies and arts. Uh, actually, my background of this speech uh, would be political philosophy related to narratology. Uh, but specifically with, uh, uh, with, with focus on politics and art of retelling related to radical, actually, point of views uh, in women cultural studies. The last year really uh, was deeply dramatic period for all of us, long impossibilities to make predictable, even basic essentials for living and artwork, uh, film even creating. So, this panel, actually, I find not just a space to talk today about film philosophy, uh, but to imagine uh, maybe a better world uh, for all of us uh, later and hopefully to open further conversation about possibilities of resistance in change into society. Yes, true narrative, but to go always beyond narrative. So today I would be focused beyond narrative. Uh, we'd start uh, from the narrative. And uh, thank you again uh, to the organizers for invitation and thank you to, to other panelists. Uh, it's really great to be here today. Let me give you briefly a sense of the structure of my speech. Uh, it would be related to feminist political economy, socialist feminism. Today is a date of uh, day of youth in socialist uh, Yugoslavia. So I'm, I, I was born uh, there, so I, I wish to stress that. And uh, actually, I would start with what uh, does caring economy means to me in times of crisis and related to cinematic thinking and how we shoot documentaries after times of crisis when we have beyond of um, or uh, on our back uh, that experience related to, uh, to this pandemic and also our try uh, in struggle to talk about democracy today, especially connected to understanding of women documentaries. Uh, this would be a good start uh, to point out Marxist political theory, something I'm uh, working on, related to new wave of women labor uh, documentaries. And there are possibilities for redirection. Now, what uh, should be subversive uh, to talk about uh, 
uh, in, in cinematic thinking uh, related to women labor in time of COVID and post-COVID times. We haven't had much production over the past year, so I wouldn't be focused on concrete, let's say, film, film analysis. But uh, I would discuss today more in a speculative way why these deeper reading of the intersectional feminism matters to the concept that I called fem philosophy or feminist philosophy, or where the direction are not just toward the philosophy, but uh, there would be an open door to political and social changes through film narrative about women labor and structural issues in society. Before going to develop these concepts, I would give, I, I'm gonna tell you what, uh, what happened uh, actually in my uh, modest uh, experience in uh, filmography. So I'm a member of the International Board of Hypatia or Hypatia, Journal of Feminist Philosophy. So last year in June, Bonnie Mann, a university professor of philosophy from Oregon, myself and uh, Brooke Burns, she's a student of philosophy, uh, same from Oregon, we created a film produced by Cambridge. So the name of the film is Gathering Feminist Voices in Time of COVID. It's about 30 minutes, so it's really uh, very short and very new. Uh, Cambridge produces, uh, produced it uh, two, two, two months ago, uh, really it's fresh. So uh, around 15 leading uh, feminist global philosophers, we were speaking about the structural injustice unpaid women labor. So now COVID made more urgent these questions to be concerned against capitalism, especially that COVID normalized uh, in a negative way, forcing uh, always economy and profit to be at front instead, instead human. So in Marxist capital, actually, that means that allowing capital to work its work with no guarantee the safety and long-term recovery of the post-COVID subjects. Uh, that's the monstrosity of capitalism, but also no open talks for any public health systems to be fully supportive in these scary times. No help, let's say, from the public institutions and all that is really feminist issue, especially when one want to turn off the socialist feminism to, to, to talk about social uh, organizing of the narrative to work in solidarity. Uh, so uh, today I wish to point out what we have from epistemic injustice in cinematic thinking. How is that subversive for us uh, to talk about the sharpened situation of inequality, but also to talk about interconnection of a different crisis, financial, political, economic, even narrative crisis, bio crisis, or uh, how local government crisis that is actually really equal to health crisis respond to all these uh, situations. So that's why I'm gonna talk about social reproduction crisis and how capitalism attacks public services and put on the impossible condition and always forcing economy and profit instead humans. So this film is not actually a classy documentary. We were gathering in front of our phone cameras. We were shooting ourselves. Everything is static, but the focus is on retelling our stories from the quarantine. Uh, fears, the past, it's all about uh, our emotions and also targeting emotional labor reporting local government oppression, the way of understanding locally the crisis and also glo global. So most of us uh, were coming from US context stuck in our own local home communities and countries. So first day after quarantine, we, share, we shared our thoughts. Uh, the mine was uh, uh, focused uh, first our impression about lockdown, uprising against systematic economic uh, and uh, from uh, US context racial injustice, uh, but also uh, we were discussing more about uh, unpaid and paid uh, labor and um, how can actually government, uh, uh, if, if they want, how they uh, could reorganize the society and uh, how it shows uh, uh, the, their sensible connection to, to people. 
Um, that's why I, I wish to stress that uh, human lives and uh, the, uh, that narrative that we want to, to explore was related to the whole capitalist infrastructure that um, in time of COVID uh, or COVID just wrap it up in a sense of uh, that thought of slow response for help, S slow response to, to, to cover uh, the processes that could be uh, um, in a mutual aid for all of human uh, in, in this humanitarian disaster and uh, collapsing of medical system at all, which is a, actually a class war and systematic structural injustice about uh, not, not just emotional labor, but care work, care infrastructure, care, caring invisible and visible or not yet visible fragile structure, uh, subjects. Uh, I'm gonna make a circle of this introduction. So uh, in this film, we were uh, uh, kind of imagining a world after and uh, uh, as I said, it was, uh, it was done last year uh, with reflection on, on maybe activism and the question where we go from, from here now. So the film started with uh, very uh, good uh, narrational voices of Chris Steele, she's a professor uh, from Stanford University and she was uh, a kind of auctorial narrator uh, she, she connected all of the narration between us. And um, she's from Stanford and she says at the beginning, the revolution would not be televised since it would be always too early and too late for that. Uh, there are several sections into the film, like, uh, as I said, uh, intersectional feminism, domestic work, local organizers, uh, organizing of, of the frontline workers, and those people in struggle, like paid caregivers that are not paid actually for this essential work or care caregivers as a really sensible category that actually are economic, economically fra uh, fragile. fragile. So see, see, since they, uh, they're they doing their work with no economical compensation and their uh, consequences um, of the some kind of intimate nature of their work itself. And that work is really specific with the COVID exposure, like talk today about, uh, let's say, intimate economy at nursing homes maybe, uh, that are COVID hotspots, but also gray zone of the households, where home um, for all of us is not the same place uh, of equality or safe place for living. Mm, in one moment, uh, by the end of the movie, Shannon Hoff, another brilliant philosopher from Toronto. She says in one moment, we are being left to ourselves. So where no voice for the narrative matter anymore matters. So capitalism uh, like model of the living shows that we are separate from the world and from other people and COVID only double check that great suffering. So from here, I would start to make um, my, my subtle in introduction for this speech today. So new complex political situation gives me to me now related a new door for rereading social reproduction theory in women doc documentaries. So where the labor of power actually is in the middle of these and essential needs and healthcare and care and health and at least and last to be human. In Marxist political economy understanding out of the logic of capital, it is life against capitalism or uh, to see the priority of this time, not by the property, but by the support of the world through the intimacy we suffer, to the intimacy we want to retell and even the way of story retelling must be reread and must be re-supported about the capacity to move around and to, to tell. Because the dynamic of our living, of course, is a different one before a year ago and after that. So COVID just wrap it up really urgent questions about to support those who care to be with, 
or cultivating the public spaces, the context of the care and development and cultivating the relations of the labor of care and narration. So first, why documentary cinema, cinematic thinking in weaving labor history and documentary, I find important for developing the concept of femme philosophy or feminist philosophy and how it could be connected to social reproduction epistemology today beyond narrative and beyond narrative limitations and connections to politics, but still in making post-politics cinema and cinematic thinking. So how or could we talk about women labor political documentary films that thinks itself? Film that thinks it itself. Fan documentary cinema, um, according to me, is a world of its own. Really, it's compressed reality, not just transferred, but the real is constructed. It's represented reality, if, if you want. And when the real, in Lacanian sense, is related to the movements, to women movements, change, human drama, health, represented a reality, then is a kind of uh, full with gaps. Let's say those gaps related to necrotizing processes in society, suffering, deaths, million of deaths, facts, documents that could be done in a speculative way today that gives flux, different flux therein for developing broader concepts beyond pure naked philosophy, beyond pure naked narratology. So cinematic thinking has become a dominant variant where we live. That's not just substitutional word of the real, but it's a kind of legit, another real that builds our perception and understanding of re reality while we try to survive. So nothing is the same when we use this parting, parting of surviving. It's not a space anymore to be escaped, of course, in, uh, in irony, into, but to fight back through cinematic thinking. That's why feminist documentary matters. And it seems especially important to me that one gets maybe to grips with the moving image that people come up uh, with a sufficient range of conceptual frameworks by which to understand it. So let me, uh, let's uh, be more specific. Moving image philosophy, or better passion for politics of the moving image gives to me a space to talk about effects of cinematic thinking in society. And that effect is political one, and it happens on emotional level. That's first. So second, how the philosophers engage with women labor film reflects how they engage with reality and the nature of that act is not just of the aesthetic experience as a form just of knowledge, but it's a part of aesthetic of resistance as well. A part of the aesthetic of equality or inequality, aesthetic of living democracy against the affirmative approach or understood in a sense of Jacques Francière, it's conversation about cinematic thinking that has political connotation and that provokes how do I read Francière historically always an aesthetically situated democratic of contemporary cinema, rather than a streaming of just theory. So his work, like Rancière's work, stimulates for me a different kind of orientation to what does it mean politically in democratic theory related to cinematic thinking. And here I'm reading that Rancière offers a kind of tool or new tools for a new topography in cinematic thinking through politics. In a sense, yes, so maybe Foucault a little bit and the Lusian investigation into micro politics of the other. But Rancière is, is more focused on something he mentioned like the axioms of rupture or the axioms of emergency of what he dismisses as the radical experience of the heterogeneous discourses. Rancière is really not a thinker of the event, like Badiou is. Uh, 
but he's rather a thinker of emancipation as something with with its own with a history that isn't just made up of great striking deeds, for example, but um, efforts of the democratic consensus always already. This line of arguing uh, is cinema, uh, for, it's important to me for cinematic thinking related to women labor documentaries because it gives me a kind of cross meta uh, intradisciplinary a power of aesthetics, philosophy, historiography, education, as well literature, film, of course, that um, philosophy as a concept for me is rooted always in everyday theory of political subject subjectivization and democratic appearance, appearance through the power of the people. So this is very important because the power of the audience actually is something that is re-enacted into the narrative. So the processes are really different because if we talk on that way that the power of the people, the power of the audience is re-enacted by the political subject, then could we talk about the real documentary cinema that could bring the change while we, shoot, uh, we are shooting them? So this is really very sensitive question to me because in documentary cinematic thinking, the focus is not on image, I think, but on the co connection between image and politics. Documentary cinema must be explored besides the evocative images and to go deeper through interdisciplinary that is always trans, that is always cross disciplinary and aesthetics of knowledge. We know what does it mean from the Birmingham School and the left wing politics and also post-colonial post critique and even Stuart Hall works. So to make it clear how documentary cinema is actually opening to social reproduction theory. We know that in a sense of Kant, for example, that we are not just aesthetic beings only during some forms of contemplating happening in front of artwork. We are thinking in a sensitive and political way to give a subversive scream and to talk about essential stops, especially in times of crisis. That is a statical way of thinking all the time and to respond to the actual time, framing our minds that would be ready to resist. So to think aesthetically for me is like in a in Lancier way to make disruptions or serial disruptions of cinematic way of thinking still in a linear way. And especially in times of crisis, this could be visually urgent because when we want to talk about paid, unpaid women wage, domestic work, health crisis, or social sensing uh, questions anti capitalism, then this moment of aesthetics and disruptions between film and fiction uh, is, is streamed in a different um, way of film stories to make the justice happen for real in dark times. So this would be my point of this discussion. I'm interested today in that perverted angle while could we talk about women labor documentaries and about changing even or breaking the genre while you're shooting women labors, docus, for example, to recreate the genre always already. So the change to happen while shooting it, uh, you change something that is real into transferring real, but in the film narrative, while shooting scenes, you remake it. You intervene in it. That's important for, for me because uh, always, let's say, uh, big documentaries like uh, we had from, um, from the, the history events from last year, like Black Lives Matters and uh, Women, uh, Women March uh, that happened uh, that regularly in, in March. Um, uh, were uh, 
uh, some uh, a kind of they they actualize those invisible and uh, visible justice injustice and uh, those questions. So frame philosophy understood like this says that could or could could be uh, could be open another way of discussion that documentary is not simply a reproduction of reality, its own world with its own intentions and fight for human rights happens during the processes of shooting and producing art or docufilms, these docufilms. So that specification actually appears from, um, from uh, dragging the real from another wor world, but the world that we want to change it. And the change is happening in that a uh, microsecond of dragging the real into the discourse of the filming. So now it's about transfiguration of reality during the processes and our perceptional power is related to labor power, which is the very social reproductional theory. And now how reproductional theory understanding reflects to breaking the genre of women labor issues. So finally, it's a question about the concept, conceptual link between cinema and not yet transfer real, where the remaking of reality happens. So documentary cinema in that way allows to receive reality, expanding our perception from the feminist political point of view. And COVID just wrap it up those clear angles of seeing. And still we are at the terrain of the real through showing a new reality. Could we talk about documentary challenges that uh, challenges our view of reality with forcing a phenomenological approach about how reality now is um, perceived, but not just uh, by our minds, but how reality is disrupted, rebuilt, rechanged in a long-term quality process against inequality while we shoot the genre, while, while we, we, we shoot the resistance. There is no doubt that most cinema starts with a recording of the real, but the argument here is that the women filmmakers would understand social reproduction theory only in relation to the very moment of the reality it records. So that specific moment that makes differentia specifica about distinctive political documentaries. Here I can include uh, movies by Agnes Varda, I, I work on, and how she understands film theory seen in a significant, let's say, critical extensions by phenomenological, a phenomenological approach, philosophy and ethics, especially her cinema is actually the movement of the sensation offering potentially critical openings. So Agnes Varda gives to me the whole new focus on neglected issues in social reproduction theory and resituation of film within culture and within political context. Finally, for this part, a really femme philosophy or possible femme philosophy concept is interwoven into the women cinema of resistance through the very commitment to the represented, not just the, uh, uh, related to the desire to be represent, but to be represented in, uh, in journey, in while doing it, while we talk, while we should, while we build the change. And that's actually something that uh, women labor documentaries, especially those who uh, in the last, uh, maybe the, the, the body of the corpus of cinematography from the a couple of few years ago, um, opens like different kind of conception uh, and uh, dragging or open discussions about epistemology and even uh, economy and the distribution of the message. Maybe later we can discuss about the corpus of those uh, splendid and wonderful uh, women filmmakers who are also philosophers like uh, Julia Reichert, Chris Mansfield, Mary Dore, and uh, 
and many of them. So thank you. Thank you very much. Th th that's it? Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, yes, th that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Senka, for this great uh, lecture that showed the uh, wider social relevance and also the transformative power, the transformative potential of the activity of filmmaking. I'm sure that uh, uh, we will have some questions related to it um, during the general discussion. And now we are moving on. It is my uh, honor to invite our next uh, speaker, uh, Neil uh, Kennedy, uh, who is a teaching fellow at French department, Trinity College Dublin of, in Ireland, and also uh, our old acquaintance from previous uh, editions of Philosophy Film Festival. The subject of uh, his presentation is filmmaking in the subjunctive, uh, subjunctive fantasy in the films of Nasser Kemir. Sorry for if I mispronounce <laughs> the uh, name of the author, uh, uh, which is, uh, yes, um, in the title of the presentation. I'm sure that Neil will, will correct it uh, eventually. So please. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes? Great. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Anna, uh, both Annas. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry I can't be in Skopje with you today, but I'm delighted to be here uh, virtually anyway in this, uh, this platform, this, uh, uh, in this uh, very strange year. So uh, the research I'm going to present is still at an early stage, uh, partly due to the recent chaos and all the distractions of the, the past 12 months. But I present it as an ongoing project in the hope that it will be of interest to you. And of course, I'll welcome comments and suggestions in the discussion. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint with me, unfortunately, but if we have time at the end, I might, might like to show a short clip from one of the films uh, that I'm, I'm going to discuss. Um, so I have chosen to attempt a re-evaluation of a particular cinematic author. Uh, a filmmaker who has attracted some degree of critical acclaim, but perhaps uh, in term academically has been somewhat neglected. And so I wish to reconsider the frame of reference in which he has up until now been understood. And I speak of the Franco-Tunisian filmmaker Nasser Kumir, who has had a career spanning over 40 years, but has only completed so far five feature films. And of these, the most interesting for my purpose are the central three, known as the Desert Trilogy, which uh, in French, Les Balisseur du Désert, or The Wanderers of the Desert, from 1986, uh, Le Collier Perdu de la Colombe, or The Dove's Lost Necklace, from 1991, and from 2006, uh, Babaziz, Le Prince qui Contemplait Son Âme, Babaziz, The Prince Who Contemplated His Soul. So these films are set largely in the desert, often in a territory of which the exact location is deliberately vague, and at a point in time which is similarly vague, but in all three cases very recognisably Islamic. And indeed the second film, where we do learn the exact setting, takes place in medieval and thus Moorish Granada. However, their setting and the way these images are framed are, in my view, both politically and philosophically provocative. So the films deliberately mix shots and settings from different Islamic countries. In an interview with uh, Novara Omar Bacha, after the release of his third film, Babaziz, for example, Kimir made it clear that in the same film sequence, his characters would look out of the window of a palace in Tunisia and would see a desert actually uh, filmed in Iran. Now, these cinematic techniques are not uncommon, but in the same interview, uh, they are endowed by Kamir with a particular meaning. They underline the fact that his films are set principally in the Arab Islamic world as a whole, and thus underline their cultural pluralism. Kamir's diverse casting choices, which include Indian, Syrian, and Palestinian actors, further underlines this point. The desert, which Kamir refers to as a special character in his films, has its own abstract and constantly shifting nature, reinforced by these particular directorial choices. Kamir states, I quote, the desert is a literary field and a field of abstraction at the same time, end quote, a statement which to my ears at least sounds distinctly Delusian. 
But the key point which I wish to investigate at this stage of my research, however, is the mystic or fantastic quality of Khmer's films. And so this is what I want to concentrate on in this presentation. So in the different films of the central trilogy, the films of the desert, there are many, many elements which present a challenge to a rationalist mode of thought. And so I've chosen this uh, title, Filmmaking in the Subjunctive, um, which of course is taken from Stanley Cavill. Each of these three films depict characters who experience dreams, prophecies, and visions, which later on come to life. There are entire villages of men who are driven to wander through the desert for decades. Characters who fall down a well and discover an enchanted palace. Characters who appear to be apparitions or spirits or an intrusion of the supernatural and so on. Yet to add to the confusion about place and time, these extra rational elements intermingle with characters who live in a modern day world of motorized transport, of organized states, of a civil service, of a police force and so on. So one of the key apparitions in Le Collier Perdu de la Colombe, for example, is the legendary princess of Samarkand, whose coming was foretold in a destroyed book, but who later makes a real appearance in the film, apparently disguised as a man. If I can manage this, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, yeah, that's not what I wanna show you, but hold on a second. Um, yeah, so this is the, so that's a still from the film. That's uh, the princess of Samarkand disguised as Aziz. Uh, now, how do I unshare? Stop share. Right. Okay, um, good. So Mark Ames correctly notes the profound influence of oral story storytelling traditions on Khmer's narrative structures, and in particular, folk beliefs in the presence of the invisible. However, for Ames, these influences are entirely Arabo-Islamic, drawing in particular on the Arabian Nights. Ames also argues that medieval Andalusian Sufi poets, as well as Iranian mystic poets, are a profound influence on Khmer. He also notes Khmer's preference for, quote, processes of fusion, juxtaposition, and collage of images and sound rather than a simple narrative line, end quote, and also notes the constantly repeating narrative elements and the fact that characters from different story strands and different films often seem to experience the same fate. And to this, we could add Khmer's preference for great circular sweeps of the camera, particularly when filming the dunes. And I, I'm here led to think of um, the, the previous uh, a very interesting talk by Professor Chateau on uh, Before the Rain and the, 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 the reliance on circles there as well. So this preference for circularity in Khmer's work is seen particularly in the third film, Bab Aziz, where the camera also discovers circles in mosques, in the roof of mosques and in palaces. So Ames argued that these artistic techniques or characteristics are a product of the strong influence of these non-linear narrative traditions. But as critics, or indeed as philosophers, is there anything more important or substantial we can say about Khmer's preference for the fantastic and the fable? So this is the beginnings of my research question. So despite the above stated preference for a degree of indeterminacy in his setting, what existing academic work on Khmer there is, and as far as I can see, there is not a great deal of it, views him uncomplicatedly as an Islamic filmmaker, someone who works entirely from within the traditions of Islam and should therefore be understood as such, and as someone whose preference for mysticism has led to him being named a modern day Sufi. And this is so even though, even although he has actually spent most of his life in Paris. Ames, for example, repeatedly notes, notes the influence on Khmer of Sufi literature, music, and traditions. Ridad Uzturk, writing within the discipline of film philosophy, also argues that Khmer's narrative techniques reflect his fundamental philosophical orientation, a way of understanding the world which is particular to Sufism. Sufism. For her, Bab Aziz relies on a conception of knowledge which is fundamentally different from Western epistemologies one based not in logical precepts, 
but on the pursuit by the believer of knowledge gained from direct experience. It's certainly true that Oosterk's work is rooted in careful and convincing analysis of the different elements of Kamir's films and what she sees as their Sufi antecedents. But notwithstanding this, I do believe that there are also problems with the academic discourse on Kamir as it currently stands. For example, Ames charges Kamir with a generalized position of nostalgia for a glorious Islamic past, for example, on the intellectual and cultural achievements of medieval Islamic Andalusia. Yet Kamir's public comments on his work, just like his films, are far more rooted in modernity than this crit critical discourse would lead us to believe. Indeed, many of his comments show that he also has much more pragmatic and always political concerns. So the groups of young men condemned by a curse to wander the desert in Les Balisseurs du Désert represent for Kimir the lost and betrayed young generations of the Islamic world. Indeed, this metaphor is presented by him as a response to the French colonialism in North Africa. Similarly, Kimir also argues that Babaziz is a response to the events of September the 11th, 2001, and represent his effort to rehabilitate the image of the Islamic world in the eyes of the West, comparing it to his father who had fallen down into the mud. It is therefore, Babaziz is therefore, in his words, a highly political film, and one whose intended audience should not be considered to be confined to the Islamic world. It is also the case that Kamir has stated that he believes he has more influence in the Western world than in the Eastern. Given this stated aim of Kamir's, we must question whether his fi this film, or indeed his body of work as a whole, is as insular or as inward-looking as Ames would have it. So despite the fact then that Kamir, as a global citizen crossing from east to west and back, clearly is deeply concerned with speaking to Western viewers, there has been little, in my view, critical and academic attention paid to potential readings of his work from outside the Islamic tradition, and for example, within this tradition of secular film philosophy, the kind of film philosophy that we are gathered here to discuss. So I wish to examine Kimir's work from this standpoint to see if it could lead to alternative valuable readings. Um, so far, and as I say, the research is in progress, but I have two key concepts from what the Western film tradition, which I would like to consider. Now, the first concept comes from the work of Stanley Cavill, who was, of course, a leading American film philosopher rather than French. Cavill himself wrote of the fantastic, or as he termed it, the uncanny, arguing that the uncanny is essential to philosophy. Cavill's description of the concept of the uncanny, borrowing from Svetan Todorov, argues that the encounter with otherness and the concomitant process of estrangement is at its heart. Cavill further argues that the literature of the fantastic is a necessary answer to prevailing philosophical skepticism, in that it is the only way for us to access what he calls the sublimity of otherness, allowing us to see through the eyes of another, another whom, as strict philosophical skeptics, we would not be able to prove even existed. Cavill says further that it is a medium of cinema which is best suited to an exposition of this concept of the uncanny referring to cinema as a realm of the fantastic. As he states, quote, I have in mind films are needed perfect power to juxtapose fantasy and reality, to show their lacing as precisely not special, end quote. In his essay, What Becomes of Things on Film, Cavill cited a number of films which he believed depicted the world of reality and fact and the world of wish and desire as being juxtaposed without any marking to set one off from the other, leaving the audience in what he terms a state of uncanny disorientation. While the filmmakers he cites are mostly Western and include Ingmar Bergman, Louis Buñuel, Jean-Luc Godard and Alfred Hitchcock, as well as the Japanese Kenji Mizuguchi, there is nothing culturally specific about this analysis which would preclude Kimir's name from being added to the list. Indeed, it would be entirely in line with Cavill's argument to note that many of Kamir's fantastic visions are driven by desire, in particular desire for mysterious female figure, as in the image I, I showed you before. So in this respect, 
the fantastic elements of Kimir's Desert Trilogy could, according to Cavo's concept, be a way for the Western viewer to access the extreme otherness of the Islamic world. And to pursue this line of argument, I believe we can make a further connection between Cavo's work and French film philosophy, in particular the work of Jacques Rancière, though I would state that at this point my remarks are, are very tentative. Like Cavill, Rancière believes that a politically progressive art, regardless of medium, serves a function of disruption, not by, Im uh, not by uh, imaging any great radical scheme for social change, but by producing an endless variety of small ruptures to the prevailing political, social and ethical norms. Using techniques of discontinuity, disruption and ambiguity, Cinema, just like other art forms, can challenge and disrupt dominant representations of sense, not just in the field of aesthetics, but also in the field of politics, at the same time as challenging classical representational models. So as Rancière has written, cinema, quote, has to consent to be nothing but the surface, with the experience of those who have been relegated to the margins of economical circulations and social tra tra trajectories can be organized in new figures, end quote. While Rancière also believes that cinema has failed to live up to what some early film theorists believed was its promise, that of being the first pure art form, he still believes that real political and ethical potential exists in the exploring of the gap between the real and the unreal the documentary and the fiction, the narrative and the spectacle. So I would like to suggest the ambiguities, the discontinuities and the fantasies at the heart of Kimir's highly political films might also be val valuably analyzed from the perspective of Western and secular film philosophy. And indeed, I would like to suggest that these ambiguities and discontinuities are a way for the Islamic filmmaker to overcome the critical and aesthetic marginalization of his subject and to disrupt the regime of sense which accomplishes that marginalization. And I just wonder if I've got a couple of minutes, would, I, would it be okay for me to play a clip? Is that right? Yeah? Yes, so, sir. great. So uh, how, how long do I have left roughly, Anna? Do you mind? Sorry, you're, you're muted. Uh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. <laughs> So it's 5.04 now, I think a couple of minutes, five minutes, uh, we can allow. Okay, so I, it's only a couple of minutes of clip I want to show. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, and if I get this right, uh, I'm using VLC Media Player. Um, hopefully you can see this. Is that, uh, if you yes. can just shout. Yeah. Can. Neil, did you pick the sound and the video like when you're sharing the screen? Because that's the way how we can also have the sound. Uh, could I do what? Sorry? When you share the screen, there are the two boxes that you Oh, can... yeah, you're so right. We sorry. can also hear the sound. We can uh, try. If it doesn't work, that's how we can do it. You can try. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll share again if that's right, because I never clicked it before. So this, share sound. Yep. Uh, optimize yeah, video sure. clip. Click. Okay, good. Um, right. So. I, uh, 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 uh. So this is uh, from the third film, Babaziz, and what I'm going to show you is um, on the, the figure on the left is Omar, um, who is about to, if I can put it this way, go on a magical journey. So I will just, um, why is this not, why is this not being relevant? Uh, yeah, so let's uh, take it up from, from here. وعانقها والنفس بعد مشوقة إليها وهل بعد العناق تداني وألف مفاها كي تزول صبابتي فيزداد ما ألقى من الهيا Thank you. 
بیچاره بازیچه شیطون شده من فکر میکنم خداوند جلوه ای از بهش رو برش نمایان کرده بهش در چشم کسی که با آن بنگرد وقتی لی تحت فی بیر قید روحی فی قصر و دیرین بیا برش بنی کل هم حبود من هم حبید کن زهر حبید هجی معای نگاه کن اون دور دورا آتیشی هست حتما یه ده چادر زدن برو اونجا مطمئن که شدی زود برگرد به قصد دنبال من Okay, I'll stop that there, but uh, just, you know, only a two-minute sequence, and I think you can see just how complicated it is in terms of the introduction of a fantasy world, the possibility of visions, the question of a vision of paradise, the fact that movement between the different worlds is accompanied through falling, accident, the possibility of death, and the fact that the desert is projected as this, you know, um, ever-present kind of backdrop which characters go to and return to. So um, a very short uh, clip to give you an idea of the real complexity of these films. And that's the point at which I'd like to stop. So thanks very much for your attention. And uh, thanks also to my fellow uh, panelists for, for your presentations. Thank you very much you know, for this uh, very inspiring uh, lecture and especially of your point about the real complexity and disruptive force of the use of magic fantasy and myths as a cinematic device. Uh, so because uh, yes, the times really, it, it never dies, but is pressing very hard. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, we must go uh, on. Uh, and uh, it is my pleasure to announce our last speaker for today, who has patiently waited for his turn. Uh, uh, he's uh, um, uh, our colleague Sasha Kukalanov, uh, MA, Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Dramatic Art in Skopje. And so we are... Uh, uh, still make a circle, uh, a kind of <laughs> a specific circle, because uh, the title of uh, his uh, presentation uh, oh, suggests that uh, we will finish uh, also with the Macedonian film, as in the beginning of the, uh, the third and last session. Uh, so uh, it was Mil Milcha Manchevsky, uh, the first presentation, and now uh, we go to the um, famous Hon uh, Honeyland by Tamara Koteska and Lyubomir Stefanov. The title of uh, Sasha's Kokolanov presentation uh, uh, would be The Environmental Ethics of Honeyland. Please, Sasha, uh, proceed. Okay, thank you. Hi to everybody again. I risk to sound like uh, Greta Thunberg with mm -hmm. this my presentation, but I will take this risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, because uh, I will talk about uh, a new reading of this famous uh, movie uh, with uh, two nominations for Oscar in uh, two different categories. So uh, I hope that uh, everybody still has patience to listen to my presentation. I will try to be short, but I can't promise that. Uh, at least I will try to be uh, in, in this uh, frame of 20 minutes. So the documentary Honeyland by directors Tamara Kotevska and Lyubomir Stefanov uh, with all its awards, recognitions and nominations on different continents and different festivals received a clear aesthetical verification from the global film community for its uh, cinematic values. But uh, what gives uh, this work of art an extra, uh, very, very specific value is the... It's on the big screen with a strong message of responsibility to nature, to the world we live in, and also to the future in which the future generation should live. 
if we do a small survey among moviegoers, who is the main character of movie Hamlet? Undoubtedly, everyone who has seen the movie, even those who have not seen it, but uh, have been exposed to media articles about it, would tell you that uh, it is a story about a middle-aged woman, Natija Muratova, and her attempt to survive in miserable conditions thanks to wild bee honey. And of course, that is true. Not only at the level of uh, layman's uh, impression of, the, of a movie goer, but also by zealously following the principles of dramaturgy for storytelling and drama structure. However, this presentation seeks to open a slightly different point of view without challenging the traditional postulates of dramaturgy, but uh, with the ambition to free them from their necessary anthropocentric worldview. What if we say that the main character of uh, the story are the bees from the wild and their struggle to survive in conditions created by miserable human nature? Okay, you probably see me now as an eco-fundamentalist, but uh, I will still explain this specific reading of the film Honeyland. From the thematic point of view, the film Honeyland deals with existential and social issues. It tells us a story about the culture and philosophy of living in a deeply sensitive and challenging economic setting. If we want to go to extreme borderlines of thinking, we can say that Honeyland with its own ethical and aesthetical views tells us uh, why modern society is doomed to decay. In that sense, <clears throat> the ecologist and philosopher Mark Sagov says that if we recognize that uh, one, utopian capitalism is dead, and two, that the concepts of resource and uh, welfare economics are largely outdated and irrelevant, then we will have to look for other concepts and cultural traditions to solve environmental and social problems. To set these priorities, we need to distinguish the pure from the polluted, the natural from the artificial, the noble from the mundane, good from bad, and right from wrong. These are scientific, cultural, aesthetic, historical, and ethical differences. In order to set a new attitude toward the, towards the world and life, a new discourse towards uh, us and our planet, as well to, as to understand how Honeyland as a single work of art can help us for this purpose, we must uh, go a little deeper in the environmental philosopher, philosophical thought and to see all the dialectical and ideological contradictions it contains. So what we actually mean when we say env env environmental ethics, according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, environmental ethics is a discipline in philosophy that uh, studies the moral relation of a man to to the ecosystem, as well as the value and moral status of the environment and its inhuman contents. This discipline covers topics such as the challenge of environmental ethics to the anthropocentrism in traditional Western ethical th thinking, the connection of deep ecology, feminist environmental ethics, animism and social ecology, the preservation of biodiversity as an ethical goal, the broader concerns of some thinkers with uh, wilderness and poverty, the ethics of sustainability, climate change, etc., etc. Uh, we can find direct links to film Honeyland in almost every one of these uh, topics. Uh, let's start with uh, anthropocentrism. In literature of uh, environmental ethics, the distinction between instrumental value and 
intrinsic value has been of considerable importance. For instance, do bees have an instrumental value for humans because they feed on the honey obtained from them and feeding is a means of survival or do bees have a value of their own independent of humans? If we believe that everything exists because of us humans, then we are adherents of one of the dom uh, one of the dominant anthropocentric conceptions of the world. Many traditional Western ethical perspectives, however, are anthropocentric or human centric. For example, the book we dramatists uh, most like to quote. Aristotle's Poetics uh, maintains that nature has made all things spe uh, specifically for the sake of man. And that the value of non-human things in nature is merely instrumental. Generally, anthropocentric uh, point, uh, positions find, uh, uh, find it problematic to articulate what is wrong when the cruel treatment of non-human animals, except to the extent that such treatment may lead to bad consequences for human beings. This is the essence of the main conflict in the film between the protagonist and the antagonist uh, in uh, Honeyland. The main human character, Atije, believes that bees have the same value as humans in the nature the honey is theirs, so she will use the verb take several times in the movie in the sense that uh, she appropriates something that does not belong to her. So on the other hand, we have the, the nomad uh, Hussein who, must, uh, who moved to, moves to her abandoned village with his family and his cattle and who believes that everything can be cultivated and doing so, it becomes a human property. So the bees belong to him because the hives are his and he has the full right of their honey and the right to decide about their destiny. At one point, he even threatened at Atije that if they went to court, he would win the dispute. And yes, he probably would. This moment in the film reminds us to a famous proposal of the ecologist and lawyer Christopher Stone from half a century ago, who proposed that uh, trees and other natural objects should have at least the same standing in the law as corporations. There was a famous case in the past when uh, Sierra Club tried to stop Walt Disney Enterprises to build highway uh, through Sequoia National Park for their purposes. Uh, Stone reasoned that if trees, forests and wild animals could be given standing in the law, then they could be represented in their own right in the courts by groups such uh, as the Sierra Club. Moreover, like any other legal person, these natural things could become beneficiaries of compensation if it could be shown that they had suffered because of human activity. When the case went to US Supreme Court, it was the determined by a narrow majority that uh, the Sierra Club did not meet the condition for bringing a case to court. In a dissenting my minority judgment, however, Justices Douglas Blackmon and Brennan mentioned Stone's argument. His proposal to give legal standing to natural things, they said, would allow conservation interest, community needs, and even business interest to be represented, debated, and settled in court. To conclude, you can kill thousands of bees in the wild, but this is not a murder for which you will be responsible because 
those bees are nobody and belong to nobody. And on the other hand, if you destroy someone's beehive, you will be liable for the damage done. So dozens of cattle may die due to negligence, as it happens to the nomads in Canelan, but no one is responsible for that because cow lives are not are their property and uh, they bear the economic damage by themselves. This is how our anthropocentric world looks like. And when anthropocentric orientation is mixed with uh, capitalism, consumer madness inevitably determines the value system we live by. Even when we are caring for animals, we do it for selfish reasons. We are uh, building their dwellings, for example, beehives instead of natural habitats or in the hollows of trees or rocks. Uh, let's bring food closer to man, that's our motto. We often see those hives along the roads, not because it suits the bees, but because it suits us, the people. Impressive is the scene in Hon Honeyland when the close-up in which uh, we can see two bees rescuing themselves from the puddle, helping each other to climb the leaf. One symbolism refers to solidarity as an ethical value. And the second, perhaps, uh, perhaps more important for the attitude of the film, is that the beast left alone will fight the dangers that lurk without anyone's outside artificial help, guided only by their instincts. In that context, we can see a lot of scenes uh, in a lot of scenes, Atijas care for her old and frail mother. Uh, the self-sacrifice to be left alone without any family so that she does not leave her mother in, is the very powerful message of solidarity and humanity. But the second symbolism that the appeal of bees through this movie, leave us alone, is an important aspect of environmental ethics and so-called deep ecology. In the scene in which Atije and her mother eat watermelon from the rural fair, they have the following conversation. Is it mild, ask, ask the mother? Yes, it is from the garden, not like those on the market, no chemi chemicals, answers Atija. The imposed taste versus the original taste. This remind me of something. Uh, when, when a friend of mine was on a business trip to Africa, one of the biggest impressions she got there was uh, the taste of bananas. Okay, but how different can the taste of bananas be? Bananas taste like bananas. No, no, she said, they have nothing to do with those in our markets. So we can conclude that the original taste of bananas or honey or some other uh, food was modified when they were brought closer to human communities and to cons consuming continents. If this was the only transformation, then great, but it is not. We learned how the, to chemically get something similar in taste and aroma. So today, in the supermarket, for example, you can buy a mineral water with the taste of banana and, I don't know, guava, for example. But that water has nothing to, to do neither with banana or guava. It is... Uh, likely that you have never tried guava in your life, but in the meantime, this mineral water has become your favorite. Fails tastes, fails aromas, fails stimuli for the senses. All this inevitably leads to fail, fails values. Because if you become a regular consumer of a lie, it cannot 
but become a value to you. So people tend to justify their behavior. So if they are users of a lie in order to justify themselves and others, they are forced to treat the lie as a value. And finally, we come to the next important issue, sustainability and care for future generations. The Rolling Stones use this lyric, you can't always get what you want. Is, is that a bad thing, not to get what you want? Should society, education, arts, government policies always tend to seek people to be supplied with uh, all they want? Should artists, uh, movie makers play a role in teaching citizens which, which wants are of value and which are not? Or should we as artists remain neut neutral on such questions? Uh, we can find some answers in Honeyland. Uh, 30 years ago, the United Nations set up a commission to deal with the uh, issue of economic development, environmental protection, and accountability to future generations. This commission published a book, Our Common Future, which uh, offered uh, something that became the standard ethical definition of sustainable development. It is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. The story of poor Ateje Murato is exactly the story of a woman on the brink of extinction and far from civilization and maybe exactly because of that, but who still remains fused with uh, nature and responsible for uh, survival. Doesn't Atije, through her personal environmental ethics, actually translate this definition into a simple, powerful message expressing understandable humanized language and told through her warm, touching, intimate human story? What is that half for me, half for bees? if not care about the sustainability of whole nature, not just the humans. Joseph Desjardins in his environmental ethics addresses some vital issues for humanity. Should present generation sacrifice for the well-being of future generation? Does posterity have rights? And do we have duties to people who do not even exist? Do all presently living people bear the same degree of responsibility to future generation? Or does that vary depending on such thing as wealth or cultural affiliation? Take half, live half, so that your bees do not attack mine, says Atije to, to Hussein in the movie. Uh, yeah, lost harmony means disharmony, and disharmony means uh, trouble for all, not just for one, because we are all part of, uh, of the whole. When uh, we eat all the honey from the bees, and bees, uh, bees must, uh, must attack other bees in the wild to survive, then the balance is disturbed. It is, is it not briefly the history of mankind, the whole history of mankind, which is a history of wars and conflicts? The ethics of preserving, protecting, and reasonably using resources to provide for those who are yet to be born has become as important as an ethical rules of how to treat the now living people animals and other living beings. But we must mention that this care contains a trap. The film shows, shows us uh, that trap very well. When uh, Hussein uh, greedily squeezes all the honey from out of the hives, 
and thus destroys both his own and Atija's families of bees. He explains this to his rebellious son. I'm doing this for you. I don't need anything. I already have what I need. Not much, but enough. But you don't. The future of children, the future generations, the future of nation, and similar demag demagogic uh, bullshits are always a cover for evil. Children serve very often as an excuse, excuse. And isn't that dis disgusting? Hmm? In the end, as a final review of the environmental ethics of Honeyland, I will stress out the moment of optimism in the film that uh, man, uh, mankind will leave the metrics of anthropocentrism or the world will find a way to get rid of us. Will there be a spring? Hatije asked her blind mother. Of course there will be spring, pronounces her last line Hatije's mother before she dies. Yes, there will be spring with or without us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kokalano, for this very uh, original perspective on Honeyland and especially for the introduction of the bioethical and, and impact and environmental ethics perspective, which is eminently philosophical one in our discussion and completely up to the point. So first of all, let me announce that uh, we've heard all the presentation for today and a warm thanks to all of participants in all three sessions for this really um, rich and uh, original perspective that uh, you shared. Uh, so uh, we have uh, left some 25 to 30 minutes for discussion, for general discussion as promised <laughs> several times, uh, although a bit shorter than originally announced in our program. So first of all, I would like to uh, invite also not only all of us, but uh, also the uh, audience uh, that are following uh, us, our conference uh, in live stream uh, if they want to uh, take part to join the discussion uh, by writing down their questions in the uh, question and answer uh, window. So we will read them uh, if there are any and try to convey to our speakers. Uh, also, uh, I would like to uh, ask all, all of you, it's okay to turn uh, on your micros and cameras if you uh, for the general discussions because the general discussion because uh, maybe some questions uh, would be asked also uh, for the participants in the morning sessions. Thank you very much uh, to all of you again. And now I'm opening the discussion. Uh, let's try to go as spontaneous as possible. Uh, I hope that I will see any uh, um, demand for uh, discussion on the screen. If not, Anna, please help me if I miss uh, somebody's intervention. So please, the floor is uh, yours to everyone. I know that some uh, we can ask uh, questions regarding the presentations in the last session. First, I suggest this uh, order, and then we can also address something left unanswered or undiscussed uh, considering the previous sessions. Please, does anyone want to start the discussion? I don't know whether I have a complete view. Neil Kennedy, please, do you want to enter the discussion or? I actually have a question about a previous session. Yes. So if we're okay. focusing on this session, I, I'll, I'll wait until yes. we finish. Yes, I think, uh, Anna, do you see anyone other that, are, that is asking for entering the discussion besides Neil? Uh, no, I'm, okay. I'm not thinking, but I think that we can open it for all the all the sessions before as we also skip the, the second one. So uh, Professor in Kennedy, please. any direction, yeah. Question. Yes, please. Okay. 
Yes, the, the microphone. Uh, can you please ask your question? Do we hear each other? And now we're hearing you. Like I'm hearing you from this side. Maybe I'll try to to, to break the ice. Yes. Uh, yes. Will Kennedy wanted to to ask a question, right? Yeah. Yes. Right, yes. I, I I can go ahead. Um. No, it was uh, just uh, something that occurred to me listening to the uh, two of the presentations uh, in the uh, first session from um, Professor Oster, first of all, and um, I'm afraid I've forgotten his name, but the uh, gentleman from Poland. Uh, Dr. Liguzinski, I think it is. Um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of how cinema and philosophy interrelates, I found it interesting that your two presentations address first of all the notion of the philosophical dialogue. So, sort of philosophy comes from ancient Greece, and it comes in the form of a conversation that takes place in the agora between let's say Socrates and the friend, and there's a, a, a sort of dialogue that proceeds through oppositions and contradictions and questioning uh, on the one hand. And then this idea of the essay um, with, for example, Montaigne as, as a kind of model, the idea of the essay as being something a lot that's very exploratory and impressionistic and uh, proceeds according to and not necessarily deduction and logical propositions, but let's say, um, you know, for example, Montaigne will talk about um, his own personal experiences and his memories of childhood and, you know, the taste of food and the smell of whatever. So um, I just wonder that, is, is there a sense in which um, in modern academic discourse, uh, we, we limit philosophy too much in the sense that in, in a traditional academic conference, you have to make a, a proposition and defend it. But like the, the, the sort of the, the heritage of philosophy is one that is a lot more, a lot broader than that. And it's one that does draw on this idea of inference and dialogue and, you know, the exploratory essay and, and you know, something that's a, a lot more perhaps looser and um, is there a sense in which, in particular, these other forms of philosophical dialogue especially lend themselves to being either filmed or to being expressed through image? A very kind of loose question, which I wondered if somebody wanted to take up. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Professor Ligozinski, would you like to uh, answer? Not a professor yet. <laughs> Okay, but, I'm uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think yeah, it's for me. It's something. Uh, actually, uh, I'm I'm very glad you asked that question, because for me, I say, despite being a highly subjective form of of let's say expression or exploration or research, is actually also something that brings back the experiment and the experience back to the humanities. Also, in my case, and um, and I've been struggling quite a lot throughout, let's say, my academic career before, and also before I took up, uh, the, let's say, the practice, with this often quite tautological mode of reasoning where you go uh, from one notion to another and then usually just look for a notion of, on the bigger plane of abstraction to, to explain something on the, let's say, more concrete level. And what essay gives me is actually this mode of experimentation, which is obviously highly subjective, but then you also delineate the, the parameters in which that experiment happened. And then you speak, whenever you speak and whenever you kind of claim an expertise, you, came, you claim expertise based on the experience of having performed the experiment uh, in that respect. And of course, it's not scientific experiment in that uh, manner. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that could be repeated. Um, and often like, you know, we, we heard a lot of statements about documentary and all, all these kind of things, but, uh, but you certainly can speak to the, to, let's say to the circumstances um, of, um, and, and the parameters of that particular experiment. And what is also interesting 
And what, what I find that as an interesting challenge uh, for the essay, because I also was trying to frame it as a certain mode of recording the experience as it, or the experience of making the argument or, or researching is looking for this material evidence um, of your reasoning. Um, and, and basically including as much of that uh, as well um, as possible in your work, if it's work that, that actually has a claim of, of being a research um, as well. Um, and what it opens up for me by presenting this material evidence, even if somebody would beg to disagree with your statement, then it gives him or her or them, uh, for me, the, also the argument or, or the, let's say, the resource on the base of which you could disagree. Uh, so you put forward, let's say, the evidence. I already made a tab for the okay. Russia army. <laughs> Uh, so that's, in short, that's my uh, my take on it. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. In the meantime, uh, we have one question from the audience. So I suggest to take it uh, first because uh, um, I think that uh, we uh, are also, we have to express also the gratitude to our colleague that uh, are following us uh, online. The question is uh, from Kanika Valia. Uh, first of all, a words of appreci appreciation for the participants. So dear all, thank you so much for today's wonderful sessions. I have a question and this is to Professor uh, Sedar Osturk from second session. Uh, the question uh, relates to the uh, topic of classification of philosophical cinema. Uh, what are the classification of philosophical cinema? And uh, do you think that uh, there is any categories in philosophical cinema? And if yes, where does the philosophical films lies in those categories? How would they are, uh, say, distributed throughout those uh, categories? Thank you very much uh, to Kanika Valia. And please, Professor Osturk, would you like to uh, answer to it? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I think it is very difficult question in many ways, uh, because uh, in my argument, uh, you know, I classify three type of philosophies, writing philosophy, oral philosophy, and cine philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we look at the uh, feature of medium, uh, we can have a look at the basic structure of uh, some things. I mean, uh, we are making some oral speech in daily life, and there are different types of uh, level of uh, dialogues, uh, ordinary dialogue, chatting, or, or you know, making irony, something like this. In order to survive in our daily life, we are just producing some speeches. But on the other hand, we are making speech here in a different level. It is a very highly intellectual level. And uh, people have to understand, have to imagine, have to have to reflect on what we have said. Imagination and reflection uh, comes uh, at this point. So uh, there are different types of books as well, you know, bestseller books, and also philosophical books, sociological books, science books. There are different types of books. So now that there are different types of books. And also there are different types of speech, dialogues, oral, oral speech. Uh, we can conclude that there are different types of movies as well. Uh, it is natural uh, for different types of movies. I think Deleuze is right uh, in many ways. Um, and he made a separation between movement images and movement images and image, uh, movement images and time images. Uh, after the first world, uh, world uh, after the second world war, uh, the meaning of uh, cinema has changed uh, because cinema uh, went to thought. Uh, so thought, I think, is the basic criteria in many way. Instead of using philosophical movies, I prefer to use thought movies thought movies, you know, because uh, according to Deleuze's argument, uh, we perceive some things when, and 
according to our perception, we act. This is the motor sensor, sensory sikama, you know, habitual recognition in the meaning of uh, Bertson, habitual, automatic recognition. Uh, so when you, when you pass into the thought level, habitual recognition can, can change into, you know, um, attentive, attentive recognition, which means we don't need to act in accordance with the perception. There is a uh, interval, there is an interval between them and inter how can we fill up, fill up this interval by memory, by, by, by dreams, by uh, seeing the obje objects. So what is important and the basic uh, starting point, I, I believe that to see the being, to see the being. And when we see the being, in itself, actually thinking starts. It means that uh, some directors <clears throat> tries to create some ideas in in a, in a way that you can see some things in a total way, in a being in itself. But, uh, so, uh, you know, Roberto Rossellini created a movie, Stromboli, you know, and also uh, Europe 51, the bourgeois woman um, was a different person before her, her son uh, died, but her son, after her son died, he uh, saw the factory in a different way. Uh, her point of view has changed. And he started, she started to think, to think. And cinema sh uh, shows us the the, the the thinking of the woman. So it is a philosophical movie. It is a philosophical movie. Why? Because we are we are ex we are not extending the perceptual thing into the action, uh, but we are filling the gap with seeing some things as they are. Uh, maybe I can answer uh, this question like this. So uh, uh, finally, finally, maybe my classific my classific classification about the movies is like this. On the one hand, commercial movies, you know, mass movies. But maybe uh, maybe we can classify these movies under three titles: mass movies. Uh, when we look at the in Netflix environment platform, we can see these kind of movies. But this is not spirit of cinema. This is not spirit of cinema. Uh, and the second kind of movie, thought movies, I think, which uh, I have mentioned before. And the third kind of movie, I think hybrid movie, hybrid. It is a kind of combination of movies. On the one hand, you can get some, some uh, cinematical uh, comp composition from the mass movies. On the other hand, uh, thought movies. It is like mixing the mass movies and and uh, thought movies, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much for this conceptual qualification. The classification questions are always difficult. We all know, know that. So please, uh, are there any other questions at this point? No questions from the audience. Anna, you wanted to please uh, yeah, I, I, I had I have a lot of questions to everyone, but unfortunately, it's it's not possible to to pose them all. So I would choose one, and in the same time, I'll use the occasion to thank everyone for really uh, fresh perspectives uh, from many different angles. We have been talking from more theoretical aspects in the first session to very transdisciplinary uh, research uh, topics in the second one and then working on on particular films and uh, even talking about environmental ethics and deep ecology so it has been a really really wide array of topics and very inspiring I believe also for the people that have followed us. Um, I would like to use this uh, chance to uh, pose a question or, or, or maybe just just as, a, as an impression to Professor Chateau and on his presentation on Milcho Manchevsky's Before the Rain. 
uh, the the it, it has been a very very fresh perspective i had a rare glimpse into the presentation early on when we have been discussing professor chateau uh, participation at a at a conference and uh with the help of uh, zen philosophy and also this idea of the uroboros uh kind of read into the structure of of the film i found it fascinating first as as, as a way of reading and approaching uh, the film uh, I was wondering because when I'm usually seeing or like watching and rewatching Before the Rain, as it is one of the most famous Macedonian films and filmmakers, Milcho Manchevsky, uh, usually the circle I also see it in the um, in the element of uh, the circle of violence that uh, it perpetuates itself and it repeats itself, coming back always. So uh, the 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 Ouroboros can be seen in the film form, but also, if I may say, in a more simplified or reduced manner, also in the content of the film and the topics that it works on. Uh, do you think that you can um, you can um, kind of read this also into the film, uh, or do you think that there is a possibility to extend this this reading or this analysis of the film also on this level, uh, which uh, shows uh, also one rather humanist perspective of the endeavor, like of the, the approach of Manchewski working on these topics. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Professor Sato, please. Mm, yes, yeah, off. Um, yeah, yes, uh, I think it's possible to extend the, the, the formal analysis to uh, to the content, but uh, well, for me, uh, it's not uh, it's not a fresh perspective because uh, uh, my 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 lecture is uh, is a very so so I, I began to analyze this kind of this, this narrative films uh, in 1968. Uh, when I watched uh, L'Homme qui ment uh, in, in the studio Bonaparte uh, in the Quartier Latin. So, you, you know, it's not a French perspective. And I, I, I am a militant, a militant, I, I don't know the, the word in, in English for militant. Uh, and militant, I, yeah. Militant of, the, of this kind of, uh, of cinema uh, from this time. You know, so that's, uh, but um, I, so as I said, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a mistake to, uh, to separate uh, the form and the content mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, uh, the, the discourse in, uh, in a film like uh, uh, before, before the rain, uh, is insepar inseparable from from the form, and and uh, it means that uh, the ideological and political message of the film, and there is a, uh, this kind of uh, ideological and political message, uh, must be uh, uh, transmitted to to our uh, our brain or our uh, our mind. Um, uh, with, with all the, the circumvolutions of the form, you know, so that's a, uh, that's a, a way of thinking, that's a, a kind of taste also. Uh, I have these states of, uh, this taste of, uh, of um, formal films, of uh, these narrative films, and, uh, and uh, um, I, I, I dislike the contrary, uh, all the kinds of films that are uh, um, final, finally realistic films, the films that that that, uh, that said to us uh, that's a, a reality. Uh, you you are watching a reality. No, I think that we are watching a film, and uh, and I think that uh, the the best films are the film um, that. Uh, uh, contain this uh, this fact, uh, the, the, the the fact of uh, what uh, Edgar Morin uh, calls uh, the ball consciousness uh, uh, in the narrative, but we know that's a film. We we know that's a film. Well, my answer. Thank you very much. 
uh, Professor Chateau. I, I thank you. Uh, so, I thank you, Anna. Thank so, you very much for your question and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So our time is up. I think that is uh, time to uh, close our conference. But before that, uh, I really uh, like to uh, share with you my uh, impression that it, it was a uh, uh, really, really successful conference and our first attempt to um, organize such an event, bring all of you together, uh, resulted in wonderful results. Uh, so um, thank you again all and I wish you that um, you all stay in good health, <laughs> which is the most important in those circumstances and that we have many, many more uh, occasion to continue our uh, joint uh, reflection and maybe to stay uh, for the question that uh, uh, were not answered, to stay in contact by mail or by uh, other electronic uh, uh, means and to continue our reflection in other format. Anna, would you like to say a few final words because as a director and main organizer, I think that you have to uh, uh, have the last word. <laughs> I think I've already said my thanks to everyone. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to be in contact with all of you. And as I said, uh, we are grateful that you have stayed with us and that you have given us the confidence to organize this, this first conference uh, in the framework of the Philosophical Film Festival. Um, and I really hope that this kind of encounters, which I see that uh, we are coming from every corner of Europe. Senka is also at the moment in the US. so. Uh, we are covering a bit of a larger uh, part of the globe and I really hope that um, uh, with this contact now with Professor Osterk from, from Turkey and the Cine Philosophy uh, Journal and the initiatives in Turkey and then with uh, Professor Jono Melarka who is in the UK and with the Film Philosophy magazine and the conferences but also having a lot of people from the region that are working in this area or St Stanislav who is working in the um, in this transdisciplinary practice uh, of, of video essay that I, I feel like it has a lot of potential of, of joining these two areas together. Uh, I really believe that this is just a, a start uh, of a beautiful collaboration and that we will have more occasions like this uh, and more platforms for opening a dialogue east, west and north, south and that uh, despite any kind of geographic uh, or other kind of barriers that by these kind of principles and with all the means of digitalization nowadays that we will use them to really become a true community and to hear each other's voices and to be able to, to advance in the areas that we are working and, and share that uh, with our audience. So my sincerest thanks to all of you. And unless someone has a uh, last final pressing question, I think that this would be the end of uh, today's conference. I think so. There's a hand raised, please. Dr. Yeah. Oster. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would yeah, I would like to invite my uh, international uh, conference between 10 and uh, uh, 12 December. Uh, the fourth uh, Cine Philosophy Journal uh, International Film and uh, Philosophy Conference. You can find the detail uh, on the cinephilosophyevents.org, uh, sorry. Uh, I hope you can uh, present some uh, ideas, new ideas. Uh, I can write the website here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Oster. And to everyone else, uh, I'm wishing you a nice evening. So the festival is starting here physically in Skopje. For those of you that uh, are in here, you are more than welcome that we see each other. For the others, we hope that we are gonna have another occasion to really see each other in person. And we are gonna send you also the catalog just to have it as uh, something in your archives. It's already done. Uh, and uh, we will stay in touch by, by the electronic means. So all our best uh, on behalf of the whole team of the Philosophical Festival. Oh. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Take care. Take care. Thank you. It was great. Enjoyed it. Thank, Thank, you. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. But Thank next you so time much. Bye from you also. Bye. Next time in Skopje. Bye bye.